Um, we next have Dr. Uh, Joshua Glazer with us from George Washington. He's also done some research on the Tennessee ASD, and um, as I said, uh, I've enjoyed talking to Dr. Glazer and Dr. Henry this morning, and um, he'll have a similar presentation and some time for Q&A afterwards. Thank you, um, Chair Brian, and uh, thank you all for having me. This is my first time in your state, and it's very nice to be here. Well, um, Gary and I work on sort of two, have two complementary research teams looking at the ASD. Theirs tends to be more sort of the quantitative looking at, at outcomes and other numbers. We've really tried to dig in on a qualitative basis to understand what are some of the dynamics, what are the experience of providers, what's been the experience of the ASD leadership, and what are some of the lessons we can take from that. <coughs> Malika Anderson, who you heard earlier, um, is a tireless champion for the ASD. Uh, I have tremendous admiration for the work that she does and for her effort. She. Uh, provides as she should a very sort of you know optimistic um, depiction of the ASD. I'm going to continue in the vein that Gary started by presenting data that shows a little bit more of the struggle of the ASD to make this work. And I think from our perspective, not that it hasn't been worthwhile or that it isn't important, but that it clearly is a struggle um, so far. And we want to sort of show what some of that struggle has been about and, and why. And hopefully that will provide some um, takeaways for you if you apply it to a different context, but still one that has some similarities. So I think you probably get by this point the ASC's theory of action, how they imagine this is going to work. Um, they bring in, by and large, external providers, charter management organizations, and they really believe in autonomy. Give these people as much freedom as they can to determine curriculum, instruction, hiring, fundamental to their philosophy and their ideology, not to tie down providers with um, hoops to jump through and bureaucratic constraints. They see themselves really different than the traditional district in that way, in that they really don't want to make them have all sorts of compliance things to deal with. They want their role as the ASD district to be minimal. They want to be lean and mean. Uh, they don't want to, they want to have as thin a staff as they can. They want as much resources to go to the school level as they can. They're not going to have departments like curriculum and instruction and special ed. They leave that up to providers. They set very lofty goals, extremely ambitious goals. They claimed very publicly that they were going to take schools from that bottom 5% that Gary talked about into the top quartile in five years. They thought that was important to set a very, very high bar and a statement to everybody that this wasn't about taking schools from being very bad to mediocre but actually creating schools where kids would have real life chances in terms of college and career, uh, being prepared for that. They have a very stringent system of accountability. They measure results very carefully. They hold account uh, providers accountable. They have so far held back on letting some providers expand the way that they wanted to because they didn't feel that they met performance expectations. They haven't yet sort of got rid of a provider altogether, said you can no longer be here, um, but they claim that they are willing to do that if a provider doesn't show adequate progress. So they are serious about accountability. There is some degree of parental choice in the ASD. You'll see a little bit of an asterisk next to that on the slide because parents can choose. If you're a parent in the ASD jurisdiction, you can opt into a different school. But as Gary pointed out very rightly, the ASD school is still the default school. So you really have, uh, I mean, I don't know the data on this, but I think very few parents who are making an active choice into that school. So that's, I put up the, that up there with uh, an asterisk. So that's sort of how they imagine this work. So we've taken away some key lessons because we've been watching over the first few years and we've seen providers and the ASD really struggle to meet the results and the achievement goals that they set for themselves. And I think they would be the first to admit that this has been harder than they expected and progress has been slower than they wanted. So here are some thoughts about why that might be the case. One, again, reiterating a point you already heard, 
These are charters that take over neighborhood schools. That is not the way that charter schools were meant to operate. It's a different idea of charter schools. Charter schools were specifically not supposed to be neighborhood schools because people thought that the neighborhood school idea, as it's typically enacted and conceived in the US, wasn't working, was problematic. Now, what does that mean? One is providers can't control enrollment. They literally have to take everyone. A typical charter has certain ways to control who comes through its doors. They can say, if you're not registered by August 1st, you can't come. In the ASD, a student can show up in September, in October, in November, at any point of the year, and they have to take them. Many charters will say, if you're running a high school, either you're here by ninth grade, or you're not here at all. We're not going to take you midway through 11th grade. Not true in the ASD. Whenever they show up, they have to take them. That creates a high level of instability in the student population that charters just are not typically accustomed to dealing with. The charters can't rely on active parent choice. Charters are usually have the advantage of having parents who know what the school's about, know what the philosophy is, and have opted in. You have more buy-in and often more parent engagement. Not necessarily true in the ASD, because the charter is running the default neighborhood school. If a parent makes no choice, and we're talking about communities where parents don't always have the resources to really make active choices, that family will end up in your school, not because they know what you're about and they chose it, just because that's the neighborhood school. One result of this is that what we found is that charters, one, one idea about charters typically, is that they can really bear down on teaching and learning. They can focus all their resources on trying to improve student learning outcomes. Not really the case in the ASD. There's too many other things for them to worry about. That isn't to say that they don't focus on this at all, but they have to divert more of their resources to dealing with the community, to dealing with politics, to dealing with parents, and a whole host of other things that they're not used to doing. And this does divert resources to some extent from their key mission of uh, improving student outcomes. And again, providers, particularly in these types of environments, high poverty environments, have a very heavy special education burden. Nationally, charters deal with somewhat less special education students than typical schools, and they're not always that well equipped to do it. Um, so in the ASD, whatever student walks through that door, he's blind, cerebral palsy, extreme learning needs. You own that student, and there's no way to counsel that person out or suggest that perhaps he'd be better off in the district school. You have to manage that. Again, that takes a lot of resources, money, time, and effort for charters that they may not be used to. So one implication of this is that improvements in learning outcomes have been progressing slowly. Um, even the experienced operators who have achieved success, not necessarily in easy environments, in places like LA, other cities, are finding that it's a bit of a struggle to them finding that it's, it's, it's a struggle and, and, and quite a whole set of challenges that they're not necessarily used to dealing with. And they've really had to adapt and really try to learn to revamp and redesign some of their operations. A takeaway from this is that providers are going to need time. And this is a point that I'm going to come back to again uh, later on, which is that even if you are able to recruit experienced providers, and even if they have shown dem demonstrable success in other places, it is probably not wise to assume that they're going to come in and really hit the ground running and have results to show in the first or second year. That is unlikely to be a realistic expectation. In addition, if you have new providers who are essentially startups who haven't done this before, and the ASD is a mix, it has some national networks like Aspire and KIPP and Green Dot. Then it has some that are doing this for the first time, and they're typically local to Memphis or local to Tennessee. They are literally building operations up from the ground, and that is even going to take longer. Key lesson number two, relations with other agencies are very important. So one thing that we see in the ASD Malika talked about 
that relationship with the local district. And she said, hey, we're trying to tell them that we're not here to take you over. And that is very much her perspective and the staff of the ASD's perspective. It is not necessarily the perspective of the local districts. For those local districts, in part you could say there's something positive about this because they feel um, some pressure to improve their performance. At the same time, it makes that relationship very difficult and very contested. The relationship between the ASD and the State Department of Education is also complex and has not been simple. One reason for that is you're talking about two agencies who have very different cultures and assumptions. The ASD is staffed by people who typically have come from outside the system, who don't really believe so much in state bureaucracies and typical districts. They tend to see them more as the problem than the solution. And now they're housed inside the State Department of Ed, and they have all sorts of things that they need to actually collaborate on and coordinate on but they have very different organizational cultures, they have very different philosophies. The ASD believes in autonomy, and the department often believes in compliance. These are not necessarily ideas that work together, and we have found that this relationship is difficult, it takes time, it takes energy, it creates tension, uh, it's not been a, a, a simple affair. I don't think that they would say this, uh, that obviously wasn't the message you heard from Malika, at the same time, um, we have noticed that the ASD can feel like it is under siege, and like it is always operating in hostile territory. It um, has a difficult relationship with local districts. It has a difficult relationship with the Department of Ed. And as I'll show you in a minute, it has a very difficult relationship with the local community, particularly in Memphis, in which it operates. I think there is no doubt that this takes a serious toll on the ASD. And as I'm going to say at the end, I think it is very, very important to think how you can plan in a way to minimize this. You may not be able to get rid of it altogether, but I think planning and forethought can perhaps lessen the degree of these sort of uh, hostile or very, very fraught relations. Um, so one implication of this is that these unresolved issues weaken cooperation and coordination. It's difficult for the ASD to collaborate with these other agencies because these relations are so contested. Uh, and the takeaway, as I just said, is to the extent possible, address these issues ahead of time and to set up collaborative structures uh, that will enable very, very important and needed collaboration with the ASD and those other agencies in their in its environment and don't think that it'll just happen by itself. Lesson number three, politics and education inextricably linked. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of negative right, backlash so. to the ASD in Memphis. Um, I'll go into that in a moment. But this um, resistance and resentment and significant pushback is a huge part of what's gone on in the ASD. And it's really important to understand why that happened, where it comes from, to what extent you are vulnerable to that here, and how you can plan in ways that would minimize it, because it creates a lot of problems which ultimately detract from the mission. One thing is that this instability, this sort of political instability, political backlash, actually is a burden which trickles down to your CMOs. It becomes something that they have to deal with. And they have to divert resources from their mission. This also complicates collaboration with districts and the DOE. The district leadership sometimes, say in Shelby County, would like to collaborate with the ASD, would like to work together. It's not politically viable because its constituents see the ASD in such a negative light that it's simply very, very bad politics for the board and for the district leadership to be seen as too often associated with the ASD. It is my view, this is somewhat speculation, but when the ASD was first formed, its original superintendent, Chris Barbick, said it was built to last. Um, we'll see about that, it, it may be. But if it is going to, in my view, it is going to have to find a way to build a broader based coalition. And at the moment, I think it's a fair statement to say 
that the politics, the local politics, threatens the long-term viability of the ASD. One implication, I'm going to hit this again later, ASD has very strong legal status. It is enshrined in state law and it has a lot of power in that. That law grants it a lot of power and authority. But that, I think one of the things they've learned and we've learned is that's not the same as having a stable operating environment. And the ASD operating environment so far has not been sufficiently stable, despite the fact that there's a state law which gives it an awful lot of authority. My takeaway, build a coalition beyond the political majority. So this, um, the ASD, don't underestimate the power of local politics. So right now the ASD is sort of buttressed by what is a Republican supermajority in Tennessee. But it's my view, and I believe that the ASD leadership shares this view, that is not a sufficient coalition of supporters. There are not enough stakeholders and interest groups who are behind it. The coalition is too thin. And that is part of what is constantly fueling <coughs> this political backlash, and which in turn is leading to an unstable operating environment. And boy, oh boy, don't underestimate the power of local politics. But I guess mm. I don't have to tell all of you that. Lesson number four, it's not just about the kids. One of the mantras that you hear ASD leadership talk about a lot is, hey, we're, this is just about the kids. Our decisions are motivated about the kids. That's what this is all about. After we were a couple years into our study, I was talking with Chris Barbick, the former superintendent, and he said, you know, it's just about the kids. And I said, Chris, I've been watching this for two years, and if there's one conclusion I've come to, it's not just about the kids. It's about a bunch of other things, too. And at some level, I think those things need to be perhaps understood as legitimate, as as issues that people see as serious and that need to be thought about. Jobs. The ASD is perceived in Memphis by many people as a threat to local jobs. In part, that is a response to the experience in New Orleans where 7,000 people were let off from the local school district. And people saw a parallel. There is an image. In some ways, it's more of an optic than a reality. But there is an image of local Afro-American teachers having to leave schools and white teachers coming from out of town into those schools. It's a bad optic for the ASD. It reinforces this narrative of people's jobs being insecure. And of course, as we all know, now I don't know how much this would apply to you, you might not. But in urban centers, the school system is a critical source of jobs and is often a, plays a critical role in supporting African-American middle class. Power, the authority and prestige to run local systems. School boards and district leaders um, do not like when their authority is attenuated. This is seen as often um, a threat to local interest groups and, and, and political power, often hard fought. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that in Memphis, this is seen by some people as simply a power grab by Nashville. Race plays a huge role in these dynamics that I'm describing in Memphis. There's a history of racial division in that city, and it shapes the way people understand what it's about. It is omnipresent in discussions about the ASD and interpretations of it. Um, this is not something that we went in knowing to look for, but it pretty much hit us over the head. Lessons learned. One, these other issues, they complicate efforts to build a strong coalition and they threaten viability. It is hard to build a strong coalition of supporters when you have an active teacher community that feels that jobs are threatened, when you have local politicians that feel that this is sort of a, a power grab, and when it pushes buttons around racial divisiveness and, 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 and a history of complex racial dynamics, that makes it really hard to build a coalition. Not necessarily impossible, 
but it really ups the ante on being strategic in how you do that. So here's my takeaway on that point. Invest time and effort co-opting local leaders, <coughs> minority groups, and diverse constituencies. Malika made a brief reference to that point in response to uh, uh, Representative Bryan's comment about what would you do differently, and she said, we didn't do a good enough job building a constituency, building a coalition of support. I agree with that. Major takeaways, don't overpromise. Um, it is my view um, that the ASD made very, very large promises which it could not keep, um, which in retrospect it had no chance of being able to meet. Um, and that really contributed to some of that pushback and some of the bad politics. It fed a narrative which said, this is one more broken promise to the people of Memphis. This shows that they were never, it was never really about helping our kids because if it was, then they would have done what they said they were going to do. Assume it will take longer than you think. I think that speaks for itself. Here's one. Depict the ASB as a statewide R&D lab, not as a panacea. If you think about this as a chance to create an enclave where innovation can go on, where new things can be tried, where experimentation can take place, that potentially can inform the state's and district's strategy overall. And that's a somewhat different narrative and a different way to depict it than as someone riding in on, the white, on a white horse who's going to save these poor performing schools. Because they may not be saved that quickly. And this, when you think about an R&D lab, well, then you sort of expect some variation. You expect some strategic failure. And you're saying ahead of time, well, we're going, to, we're going in knowing there's going to be some of this, but we're going to learn from it. And we're going to get smarter about it. We know there's not going to be instantaneous success. Again, a political majority does not equal an enduring coalition. I think I Stabilize funding. Uh, I know there were some questions about the role of private funders, and there's been a lot of private money that's gone into the ASD. I will just point out that the ASD has no budget line on the state budget, which means that that entire operation is solely funded by private money. One implication of that was that for a considerable amount of time, the leadership of the ASD had to turn all its attention to fundraising somewhat desperately because their race to the top money was about to run out. So far, funders, as Malika said, put in $100 million. That's a significant amount of money. But I think we all know that philanthropies are notoriously fickle. So in the long run, complete reliance on private money could very well be a source of instability. Finally, success depends on strong providers. I think this is fine. Maybe one. Success depends on strong providers. I can't stress this enough. And again, reiterating the point that Gary made and that Malika made. Governance changes won't amount to anything if you don't have providers that can deliver the goods. I have some views from past work that I've done on what distinguishes more successful providers from less successful ones. <coughs> I won't go into that here. But it all hinges, it all hinges on how robust and thoughtful and developed and smart those strategies that your providers bring. And no <laughs> governance change in the world is going to substitute for that. I say assume that new CMOs need five years to build infrastructure. That's your startups. That number five is somewhat arbitrary. The point being that if you are going to be relying on people who are doing this for the first time, you should know they are going to take several years. Think a bit of a, a business startup, how long an investor will give it till it expects it to turn a profit. A while. Here I'll make a little plug for, for Gary and me. Objective independent research builds credibility. Not only does it give us jobs, but when you have um, a domain that is contested, that is political, that is ideological, 
that can be difficult to understand, there is a real value of objective independent research and that it builds credibility uh, for the entire enterprise.